Oh, this will be a quick and easy project. Shouldn't take more than a week or two, right? <laughs> yeah, three months later, here we are. Um, I'm going to start off the video here, start off the new year with just a quick update on the 2072 project. Um, as you can probably tell, it doesn't look a lot different from the last video. Um, I have been working on it here and there. Um, as far as the tractor chassis goes, I got the new brackets installed for the uh, torque arms from Extreme Motor Works. Um, it's just a piece of cut steel. It's like probably quarter inch thick. I installed the plates with some new hardware, so now those are nice and rigid. Shouldn't have to worry about any flex. I pulled the charge pump coupler off, and I pulled the charge pump off, cleaned it out, and resealed it with a new seal and uh, a new O-ring. And uh, I was also investigating the sloppy steering issue that I was having. I took this tractor up and down the road a couple times in the summer, and I noticed the steering would want to wander, which is not really a characteristic of a tractor that's only got, you know, 1,046 hours on it. That's not something you usually see on these tractors until they get, you know, several thousand hours. Um, so I did a little investigating, and I narrowed it down to the power steering cylinder itself. Um, upon further investigation, the mounting bolts for the cylinder were actually just had they had worked their way loose so this bolt back here on the rear hind joint had started to work its way loose so i tightened it up and the front bolt for the front hind joint actually was missing the nut that goes underneath there so that was just kind of spinning in there by itself and this washer down here was also gone so i don't know if somebody took that apart at one point and didn't put it back together correctly with all the right hardware but uh nonetheless i just uh, got the bolts tightened up and uh Seems to be good and tight now, but I won't know for sure until I actually get the tractor running again. I got the new piece of uh, foam insulation installed on the firewall to help block some of the debris from getting sucked into the flywheel. Um, just a quick and easy step. And I think I forgot to mention this before, but in the process of pulling the engine out back in November, I managed to break the connecting eyelet off of the starter cable lead. Um, so I just put a new one on there and uh, added some heat shrink to make it secure. And I've just kind of been going over the tractor with a fine-tooth comb, really addressing anything that looks a little concerning. Uh, I still have to replace the fuel lines. Just, um, I mean, they don't look bad, but you know, God knows what kind of fuel this thing's had run in it over the course of its life. So it's always a good precautionary step to just go through, clean the fuel system out, and replace the fuel lines. And the rubber fuel lines get, get hard after so many years, too. So it's just a good step to take. Um, I also replaced the steering wheel center cap with a shiny new one uh, it really makes a difference uh, the original one was faded and the cup cadet logo was gone i replaced the key switch i said in the previous video that it had the wrong key switch so i got the correct four position switch and that's all taken care of uh, one other thing i forgot to mention i also replaced the hood ornament it, the original hood ornament was gone, but somebody replaced it with a little pull handle, so I took that off, and I don't know why you'd put a handle here anyway, because you're getting the least amount of leverage pulling the hood open from here as opposed to back here. So I don't know who decided to put that on there, but I put a correct, um, this is an original, not a repop hood ornament on. Um, just It's the little things like that that make the biggest difference, because when, when the hood's on the tractor, you really, you know, it's the things like that that people notice. Um, now, as far as the engine goes, uh, I know it may not look a whole lot different from the last time you guys saw it, but uh, I actually have done a significant amount of work to it. Uh, it's almost complete, I mean, with the exception of the, the large pieces, mostly just the shrouds and manifolds that have yet to go back on. Um, the internals, all the, the really important stuff that I was worried about is done. Um, also, don't mind the flash rust here. I think uh, one night this week when it was real cold, we had some moisture get in here, probably because the garage doors here don't seal very good at all. Um, the building's over 100 years old, so you can't expect everything to be perfect. But uh, nonetheless, I think we got some moisture in here, and it just caused some flash rust. So I'm going to, obviously, before I put everything back together, I'm just going to clean that up real good. Um, I think the last time you guys saw this engine, uh, I was talking about my plans for pulling the cam out and inspecting everything. To make a long story short, I did pull the cam. Uh, that wasn't too hard to do. The cam looked good. The lobes all looked good. The valves looked good. Uh, I checked everything, the lifters and the springs as well. Everything checked out okay and within spec, um, except as I su suspected, the cam bearings were shot. The one on this side was worn and uh, a lot of the material had actually peeled off and pieces of that material were sitting down in the oil pan so that was a little uh, that was a little concerning but there was actually a lot of bearing material left so 
Um, it's I think from that it's safe to assume that the bore for the bearings, um, you know, for the cam were okay. Because a lot of times when the cam bearings get worn out, it also takes a toll on the bore that they sit in. But there was a lot of bearing material left, so um, I think the bore was okay. And everything checked out, like I said. Uh, so I got that, I, I got some new bearings ordered. I drove the old ones out, pressed the new ones in. That was fairly straightforward. There's really not a whole lot to it. It just, you know, it takes a lot of patience. Uh, and then once I got that taken care of, I, uh, before I put the valves back in, I went through and I decarboned all of the ports for the intake and exhaust valves. I just cleaned them out real good with the wire brush as best as I could. Um, when you, you know, when you let that carbon build up in there, linger, um, all that does is allow more heat to be generated and it makes your engine run hotter and less efficient. So, um, I, you know, spent some time wire wheeling the ports out, trying to get everything cleaned up as best as I could and reinstalled the valves and got them adjusted to spec. I think the last time you guys saw this engine, the heads were off and I was discussing having a machine shop building them down. I did end up going that route. I took them over to the little Amish machine shop down the road and uh, for, I mean, it, it wasn't cheap. They charged me 110 bucks, but uh, the machine shop milled the heads flat and put a nice polish on them too. Um, and they also bead blasted the heads, so they're all nice and clean now. And uh, that's basically a good guarantee against having any debris or anything built up inside those cooling fins. Because sometimes when you when you try and blow those out or, or wire brush those out, you don't remove all the material down in there. And, uh, you know, as soon as you start putting the engine to work, mowing grass or doing whatever, if there's a little obstruction in those cooling fins somewhere, debris is going to start building up right away. That's why it's so important to keep them fins clean. Uh, so the, the Amish machine shop, they did a really nice job uh, milling the heads flat and bead blasting them. And then I reinstalled them on the engine with with nine new uh, grade eight bolts. That's a step that people often overlook. Um, you got to remember with these engines, especially with an aluminum block, um, the bolts, the head bolts will stretch because all of the heat that these engines produce is right in here. And, you know, the head has to absorb and dissipate a lot of that heat, which is one advantage of aluminum instead of cast iron. But uh, over time, you know, after so many heat cycles, those head bolts will stretch. So if you blow a head gasket or your cylinder head gets warped and you go to you know, mill it and put a new gasket in and reinstall it, you're not really doing yourself any good if you're just reusing those original head bolts because there's a good chance they're stretched. And even if you torque them to spec, you won't be able to get that same seal as if they were new. Um, so it's it should be standard procedure for anybody who does this kind of stuff to replace the head bolts every time they replace the head. Now these Onans are a little bit tricky because they use two different sizes of head bolts. Actually, I think some later engines even had three different sizes, but it's just a matter of getting a head. I think I used a... A 5 sixteenths by one and three quarter or, or two inch long bolt. Um, I tried to keep it as uniform as possible. Um, torqued them all to spec. I also installed some new spark plugs. I, I'm running the hotter spark plugs, the Champion RS17YX. These would have originally had a RS14YC, but the 17s, I think from, if, if I'm wrong, somebody correct me. I think the 17s are a hotter spark. Um, at least that's what Onan recommends now in the in the later manuals. Also, per the request of or per the advice of Boomer, my parts guy, um, I also rebuilt the oil pump. Uh, that's very simple to do. When you take the oil pan off, the the pump is very easy to remove from the engine. It's just one gasket basically, um, and that sets the backlash on the two gears. It's just a simple gear pump. The thickness of the gasket, you know, determines the seal there and determines the backlash between the two oil pump gears and uh, the oil pump rebuild kit comes at least from Boomer um, from Boomer's own and parts he provides three new gaskets of different thicknesses depending on what your original gasket was as well as a new key um, so that was very simple and easy to do um, so I also you know, got the oil pump straightened out that should be good for many more hours of service I checked to see if this had the plastic fly ball spacer but being an 85 build it has the metal one so that was no concern um and uh just kind of gave it a good once over i replaced pretty much every gasket and seal all the you know the intake and exhaust manifolds will be getting new gaskets when those go back on um, i also have new gaskets for the points i have a new set of points in the box there but i managed to in the process of putting the points back on i actually broke the base plate that the points attached to so i'm waiting for a new one of those to come in um, but other than that, it's coming together very well, and uh, hopefully within the next week or so, this thing will be making some noise. Um, I'm 
currently at a standstill while I wait for parts because both of my snap-on torque wrenches are broken. Um, go figure. I have to send them out to get rebuilt, uh, so I have to borrow a torque wrench from somebody that, so I can do the final torquing on the heads and the manifolds. With these owning engines, you want to make sure that everything is torqued to spec. You don't just want to torque it by feel, especially with these intake manifolds, with the way that they seal. Everything should be torqued to spec. You don't want to risk a manifold leak because everybody knows how much of a pain in the rear end those surging onans are especially when you have an intake leak i'm also waiting for a new fuel coil for the pto clutch because the original one the windings were pretty much shot i discovered after i took it all apart and at some point one of the three studs for the adjusting lock nuts broke off so somebody drilled a hole through the back the uh, backing plate and um put a bolt in there with the wrong size nut so how that pto was still working i don't know but the armature is okay uh just the fuel coil was shot so i ordered a new one of those waiting for that to come in as well that was not cheap but i figure if i'm going to be mowing with this tractor around here uh it'll be worth it in the long run so my plan for this tractor is to get it back together in the next couple weeks and bring it to the indoor expo at the lebanon valley expo center uh that's february 18th and 19th if you live in the Northeast, uh, come to that show. I highly recommend it. It'll be a great turnout this year, and there's a lot of good, rare, and uh, collectible tractors there on display. So I will be sure to have this 2072 there, and uh, I'm, the deadline's getting pretty close. Now, I'd like to spend the rest of the video just kind of going over the plans I have for this year and kind of for, you know, just the future, just in general. Um, as you can see, I've taken on a lot of projects. I've got the, the International Cub here. I have the carburetor off of that. It's still sitting in pieces on my workbench. I got an ultrasonic cleaner as a Christmas gift. It's over there on the bench. So I have to, uh, when I get done with the 2072, my next project is going to be getting the carburetor clean, put back together, and getting this tractor running again. And then I want to get it out of here. Um, so this will be for sale come spring. Uh, once that is done, I am planning to start working on the H back here. I bought this last July, and I, I rolled it in here, and I have not touched it except for using it as a parts hanger, as you can see. Um, I bought this because I wanted this to be like a good leeway into working on the two-cylinder tractors. Aside from my grandfather's 60 restoration project, I have not had a whole lot of experience working on the two-cylinders, and I figure the H's are small, but they're pretty stout for what they are, and... Uh, this is a basically restoration project that just needs a few last things put on it to be finished and could use a paint job as well but i'm more focused on the mechanical side of things this really doesn't need much aside from the the water pipe put back on uh, the magneto put back on and the shutters put back in um, and just needs everything adjusted and it needs filled with fluids and all my plan was to hang on to this h for a long time just because they're getting more and more collectible um yeah, I mean, they're, they're not making any more of them, so they're not getting any easier to find. Uh, there's a good handful of them out here in Lancaster County, PA, though. There's a lot of farmers that are still using these things. So there is a market for the two cylinders, especially the uh, the Amish folks living out here. They love these things. Um, but like I said, the H's are getting more and more collectible. Um, you just don't see too many of them anymore. And my thought was to hang on to this tractor for a long time, just to kind of have it in the collection. But, uh, you know, as I've as time has progressed and uh you know as my work schedule gets busier and busier and my time out here in the shop gets you know lesser and lesser i've realized that i think keeping the h in the long run may not actually be the best idea for me because at the end of the day i still have my grandfather's two old tractors that have been patiently waiting to get restored back in new jersey um and that's, you know, restoring the 60 and the 4,000 is something I've wanted to do since I was, you know, 10 years old. So we're going on, you know, 14, 15 years now of waiting. And uh, I keep putting it off and putting it off. But out here, you know, I've got the space now. I'm, I've am i been acquiring the tools. And out here in Lancaster County, there's plenty of resources that are knowledgeable when it comes to these two-cylinder tractors. So if I'm going to rebuild the 60, I mean, this is the time and the place to do it. So, as a result, I've decided to uh, prioritize working on the 60. Um, obviously, the shop does not look like it right now because it's still a freaking mess. Um, but to give you guys a rundown of my plan for this year, my goal is to have the 60 in here by the end of the year, which means that I'm going to have to make some room. And in order to do that, the Cub is going to have to be sold. That'll be sold come spring, like I said. And unfortunately, I'm going to have to sell the H as well. Um, 
but not before getting it running. I would at least like to, you know, just practice with it and get it running and run it around a little bit first. Uh, like I said, I hate to do it, but my grandfather's tractors take priority. Um, and unfortunately, I think I may have to sell the 318 as well. I know it seems sacrilegious of me to say that, but uh, I honestly just don't, now that I live here, you know, I'm not mowing a lot of grass or anything like that. Um, I just don't have a use for the 318 anymore. I mean, you know, I hate to say it guys, but this tractor has been sitting here untouched since September. Um, I just don't use it as much as I thought I would. And this tractor has spent a lot of its life just sitting. Um, that's why the hours are so low on it, but I would like to see it go to a good home where it's going to get used and, you know, loved and taken care of. Um, and it does need a little bit of work. The engine, as you probably figure from so many years of sitting, a lot of the seals in the engine are going bad and leaking. So I've got a lot of gaskets and seals ready to go in it here. Um, that was another project I was planning to get to, but I just don't even know if I'll have the time. I'll see what I can do with the 318. Um, I may try and do a little bit of work to it before I sell it, but um, it, of course that, that's all dependent on the time I have. And uh, the 20, or the, excuse me, the 782, I ha I'd have a hard time getting rid of that because I, you know, invested a lot of money in it and it's a custom build. I mean, there are no other 782s out there like this one. Um, so I'd be hard pressed to get rid of this one. I'm going to be hanging on to it. Uh, it needs a little bit of work, but uh, it's a good conversation piece it shows. So I'll be hanging on to it. Like I said, what it boils down to is that my grandfather's tractors take priority and they've been, they've literally spent their entire lives outside. I don't think those tractors have spent a single night under a roof um, in the, you know, 60, 50, 60 plus years that they've been around. Um, so it's time that they get proper TLC and uh, they're going to get the restorations they deserve. Now, of course, when it comes to buying and selling antique tractors, you got to have a decent, you know, a decent sized truck and trailer to haul that equipment as well. Those of you who have followed me for a long time, you know that I have been running a 2000 F-150 that I've, I've had since high school. It was my first truck. You know, good old half ton. That truck served me very well. Um, I also had a single axle six and a half by 12 utility trailer that I pulled my lawn equipment around with and hauled garden tractors to shows with. Um, but the truck and trailer served me very well over the years, but, uh, with the equipment getting bigger and heavier, um, it just, and with my tastes always evolving, it was time to move on. And uh, I foresee myself collecting a lot of bigger tractors in the future. Um, so I'm trying to prepare now for what will come. So I was due for a, a fleet upgrade. And so, I'd like to introduce to you guys the newest members of my fleet. <laughs> so, I went from a 2000 F-150 extended cab 8-foot bed in deep Wedgwood metallic blue to a 2000 F-250 extended cab long bed in deep Wedgwood metallic blue. Um, this truck has the 7.3 liter power stroke diesel V8 and, uh, you know, the, the legendary 7.3 they call it, I guess. Uh, you'll have to excuse the salt. It's uh, This truck needs a bath, but it's just been too cold to wash this thing. Um, I bought this truck back in October, and shortly thereafter, I sold my old F-150, my blue one. I still have my red F-150, the one that belonged to my uncle, but it's back in New Jersey right now getting some work done, and I'm trying to keep it out of the salt as much as I can because that truck is just too clean. So I picked up this F-250 back in October, uh, thanks to the help of a couple of friends. I managed to find out about this truck that was for sale locally, um, about 40 minutes from here. And uh, an older couple had it, and uh, had it maintained by the local mechanic every year, so it's in pretty good shape. It's a 2000 model, um, it's got 180,000 miles on it, and uh, I have a lot of learning to do with these diesels, no doubt about that, but uh, I'm not new to them by any means. There's just, when it comes to, you know, running these things, maintaining them, and modifying them, there's so many, there's so much to learn. And uh, I've wanted one of these trucks since I was a little kid. I mean, my uncle had a 2000 model year F350 dually with the 7.3, and then he, and now he has a 2005 dually with a 6 liter, and uh, I grew up around these Super Duty trucks, and uh, I always wanted one for myself. So, uh, and I have plenty of friends that are running these trucks that have been running these trucks with a lot of success, especially the 7.3s. And they've, you know, they've, especially when you compare to what they produce today, the 7.3s are very reliable and have a great reputation. 
for longevity. Um, so I, I figured it was about time I jump on the bandwagon. So I sold my F-150, my old F-150, and I bought this old girl. Um, it's funny, this one's actually older than my truck that I had before, and it's the same color, but uh, it's a, uh, it, I, my plan is to hang on to this thing for a very long time. Um, you know, the 7.3s run forever with proper maintenance, and in my personal opinion, the Ford first generation Super Duty, you know, 99 to 03, um, were some of the best trucks ever built. I mean, you can fight me to the death on that, but you know, the number of trucks that you still see running out around on the road these days pretty much confirms that these trucks are everywhere and guys just love them. So I'm proud to have this truck. It's going to get taken very good care of. I do have some build ideas for it in the future, but I'm not looking to do anything crazy anytime soon. Um, but I will be making videos on this truck, you know, riding in this truck, and this will be my new toy hauler. Uh, so it was time to upgrade. Uh, like I said, I upgraded the truck, so I needed to upgrade the trailer as well. And I sold my old single axle trailer, and I bought this 2022 PJ B5 buggy hauler. Um, it's a B5 model 18 foot long with the two foot dovetail and i ordered this trailer back in may of last year um and waited 16 weeks to get it in sorry for the wind by the way uh, of course the wind decides to pick up as soon as i come out um but i ordered this trailer back in may of last year and uh, i waited 16 weeks for it and it came in in september and uh i went with the pj for a long list of reasons which i'll get to in another video i'm going to do separate videos on the truck and the trailer but um PJ was the only local vent, uh, local dealer that would build me a trailer that I, exactly like I wanted. And uh, I ordered this trailer specifically so that it was big enough and heavy enough to haul a farm tractor, you know, such as the John Deere 60, but small enough to haul a couple garden tractors. And uh, I waited 16 weeks, and I got to say, I think it was worth every penny and every minute of the wait. Um, like I said, I'm going to make another video on this thing uh, in the future when it gets a little warmer outside. Uh, so you'll have that to look forward to, but I uh, just wanted to give you a quick sneak peek on the two new fleet upgrades and uh, My thinking is that you know, these are These are the truck and the trailer were quite the investment But they will last a very very long time and they'll they'll serve me well for years to come as I expand my collection and as I continue to grow in uh, my capabilities So all right, it's cold. I'm closing the door um so yeah, I uh, I've been you know making some important investments, important upgrades to the fleet, and uh, we'll be thinning out the herd here shortly to make room for something that has been in the making for a long time. Uh, I think I should also mention that uh, when you're doing a restoration on an old piece of equipment, you may find that it is a good idea to stock up on parts and uh, in some cases it's actually cheaper in the long run to purchase a parts donor than to purchase all the individual parts for the restoration and uh, in the case of the 60 project that's exactly what i did so i'm going to put some pictures in the video here now so a couple weeks ago i picked up another 1954 john deere 60 tractor for parts um, a friend of mine down in south jersey was selling it um, and being a 54 model, it's the same year as my grandfather's, you know, the one that I'm restoring. And it also just so happens to be a vegetable special, just like my grandfather. So it has the extra long uh, heavy-duty axles with the cast reversible wheels um, and a single front wheel. And uh, that c configuration is not, I wouldn't say it's rare, but it's definitely not common. And it just so happens that my grandfather's tractor was set up the same way. Um, the single front wheel was eventually swapped out for a wide front, but... A lot of the components are interchangeable, and uh, especially those obscure vegetable components. So um, he listed the tractor for sale. It had been sitting for a couple months, and uh, he never officially had it running, but he could get it to cough with a little bit of gas down in the intake. Um, so I know it was in running condition when it was parked, and it's honestly not in bad shape, as you can see from the pictures. The sheet metal is, for the most part, pretty straight. And everything is there, even a lot of the parts that are 60, the Project 60, is missing. Um, so I got it cheap enough that it's going to be a good parts donor. Um, I hate to tear down a good straight tractor, but you know what they say, uh, you know, good tractors make good parts. And uh, it's kind of ironic that the parts donor is actually a nicer shape than the Project, but and it'll be worth it. You know, I'm doing it for my grandfather. So my plan is to, once I make some space up here in the shop, I'm going to bring the Project 60 up here and 
uh, keep the Part 60 back home in New Jersey at my uncle's place and then just slowly you know, pick and pull parts off of it as needed and bring them up here. I'll probably just end up storing them in the other part of the barn over there. Um, and along with that, I'm going to need something to move the machine in and out. Um, I mean, I know most, most people who do this either have a forklift or a skid loader or a small loader tractor. And, uh, I don't have them, you know, a crazy amount of space, but, uh, those two cylinder tractors, especially the sixties are not light and to roll it in and out of here, you know, if I have to, if I'm wire wheeling or sandblasting or welding or something and I have to take the chassis outside, um, it's going to be a lot easier to do that with a bigger piece of equipment than to try and push it out by hand. So um, I decided that I'm going to, uh, when I, once, I sell the, once I sell off some of the fleet here, I'm going to use the money to purchase a small loader tractor. Um, I'm looking at a little Ford utility tractor with a loader. Um, the Fords are what I cut my teeth on. You know, my uncle has run them in his fleet for years, and I'm convinced they're just about the toughest tractors made. Those little three-cylinder diesels are bulletproof. There's lots of good choices for little utility tractors out there. Um, I've considered compact tractors too, but I just need something heavy, and a little hydrostatic compact tractor, I'm afraid, isn't heavy enough to do what I want to do. My plan is to basically just use the tractor, you know, the said loader tractor for moving 60 or 4,000 parts in and out of here um, and loading, you know, if I have to haul it somewhere to get worked on, um, obviously it'll be easier to have a second machine to help with that. So I'm going to need a pretty substantial or heavy utility tractor. So like I said, I'm looking at a Ford industrial tractor, kind of like what my uncle has. Um, they're cheap. They're easy to maintain. They run forever. And uh, if I can find a small one, like a low profile one, it'll be just the right size to fit in and out of here because that's my other constraint is that I need a tractor to haul uh, or to move, to easily move in and out of the garage door in, in this tight space. I'm going to mostly be confined to this bay on this side here because my neighbor uses this bay over here. Um, but it won't be a problem when I get, you know, when I get some space freed up in here. So my plan is to have the project back in that corner and then I'll just keep the garden tractors up here in the front so I can easily move them in and out. So... I don't have a big professional shop or a fancy pole barn or none of that, but I think we can make do with what we got. So that's the plan for 2022. My goal is to get the 60 up here and start working on it uh, by the end of the year. So that's my plan for this year, guys. Um, just kind of give you an outline of it there. I'll have more videos of the, the new truck and the trailer. Like I said, once spring comes around and it warms up a little bit and I can actually get them cleaned off because they both look terrible right now. Um, and at some point, when I get the chance to be back in Jersey uh, on a weekend, I will make a video of the 60 parts tractor that I picked up as well. Um, and I'll make a video moving it up here and everything too, but uh, that'll come in time. So we're, you know, we're, we're really getting down to the wire now. I'll be getting the 2072 back together here in the next couple days, hopefully. Uh, I'll have that at the Lebanon Valley Indoor Expo. Like I said, highly recommend you guys come out to that show and check it out. It'll be a great time. Um... So I'll get that back together, get the Cub back together, get the H running, and get those sold. And then we'll decide the fate of the 318. And once that's taken care of, then the 60 will be coming up. And uh, I'm also keeping an eye out for a loader tractor. So I'm looking for something in the size range of like a Ford 2000 or 3000, or even an industrial with a little, you know, with a heavier chassis, like a Ford 230 or 335 or something in that size. So... We'll see what the year brings, but uh, thank you guys for your continued support. I uh, do apologize for the larger larger gaps in between videos, but uh, it's just the way life goes sometimes. So thanks for watching, guys, and uh, we'll see you next time.